Hello, Alexa. Hello. We are pleased to welcome you to the AWS Summit in Brussels. Please welcome to the stage, Vice President of Amazon Web Services Worldwide Public Sector, Max Peterson. How's everybody doing? Yay. Excited to be uh, learning from people in person, participating in person, meeting friends and colleagues in person? Good. Well, I tell you what, I'm so excited that we're able to meet you here today and have these important conversations and this learning event. Um, it's exciting to be back face to face. Um, and then we also want to welcome that, uh, those of you who are joining us from our virtual audience. Uh, as uh, Alexa said, my name is Max Peterson, and I run our worldwide public sector business where we help our customers innovate across education, government, healthcare, aerospace and satellite, not-for-profits, all of them to be able to deliver on their unique missions. Um, before stepping into this role, I had the great opportunity to be able to run our non-US business uh, based out of uh, the UK for five years, from 2015 to 2021. And so it feels really good to be back here again and back in person. It feels like being back home. Um, I'm also honored to be your warm-up speaker today because what I'm really doing is going to uh, give you a couple of quick remarks before I introduce Isabella Gregor Chekovitz, who is our head of Europe, Middle East, and Africa uh, for our public sector sales, and she's going to be delivering your keynote today. Um, our last summit here was held in 2019, um, and those past two years have been extraordinarily difficult in so many ways for so many people. Uh, it continues, in fact, to be a challenging time as we keep on navigating the pandemic and then other tragic events that are taking place around the world, and, and in fact, right here in Europe. Uh, like many of you were watching the situation in Ukraine uh, with, with deep concern, uh, with deep feelings for the uh, affected people, and importantly, helping out where we can as part of Amazon. We're donating to organizations that are providing critical support on the ground, and we'll continue to work with NGOs and our employees and our other partners to be able to provide relief support efforts uh, for all of those affected. The team is also working closely with Ukrainian customers um, and with the government and affected partners to help make sure that their applications are up and still running and help make sure that their data is still safe uh, and secure and protected. And you'll hear more about these efforts later on. Uh, and so um, as I get going, let me just make sure that I uh, uh, hope that you all and your families are staying safe and staying well uh, in, these, in these circumstances. Um, the pandemic really brought into focus the reality that no matter what sector you're in, no matter what country you're in, our lives and our livelihoods are in fact uh, tied with the way that public sector operates in so many ways. Uh, with the speed and the resilience of the cloud, our customers have been able literally to save lives, to provide critical citizen services, um, and ultimately change the way that we've learned to work and live, the way that we engage, the way that we educate, and the way that we do business. In the past year, we've worked alongside more than 45 countries to support public health initiatives, 26 national governments to build vaccine management systems, and 22 ministries of education to adopt and scale up the online learning capability that was necessary so that students could keep on progressing. We also have over 10, uh, 100,000 partners um, from more than 150 countries that are so important to the work that our customers are doing, many partners represented here today, uh, important to the work that our customers are doing, and in fact, important to the progress that we've made um, through the last two years, two years of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we continue to double down on privacy, on data protection, and on security. We've recently declared 52 services compliant with the Cloud Infrastructure Service Provider of Europe, known as CISPs, 
Data Protection Code of Conduct. And the reason that that's important is it provides assurances to you and transparency to you above and beyond those things that are simply required by the general data protection regulations. So I want to start by thanking you for all of the work that you've all done uh, in very difficult circumstances over the past two years and the dedication that everybody has shown to the communities, our constituents, and all of our customers together. COVID accelerated the digital transformation across many businesses and governments. Customers tell us they saw themselves advance their business three to five years. And I believe that many of those and the basis for future innovation. Um, what used to take years to accomplish was done literally in days and weeks, showing us exactly what is possible. One of the many benefits of the cloud is that it enables and drives collaboration across industries. In research, this is accelerating the time to science and contributing to breakthroughs that in areas like climate change and drug discovery that impact all of our lives. COVID and this rapid development of the vaccine provides a really powerful example. Um, we've all been in awe at the way that scientists have worked together to quickly help combat the pandemic. Moderna was able to complete the sequence for its mRNA COVID-19 vaccine in just two days by using AWS machine learning capabilities. Just two days. There were great examples in the video. That enabled them to actually release the first clinical batch of the vaccine in just 25 days later. And each of us are living examples now of the good that happens when researchers are able to quickly collaborate and focus on the science and not the servers that accelerates the time from raw data to results. And the pandemic has served as this kind of unfortunate forcing function uh, to create a host of new virtual solutions for things that have traditionally done in person. The cloud helped organizations to move faster, substantially increase scale, while also improving security and managing to keep costs low. And as we head into the next normal, these digital and these hybrid approaches, I think, are here to stay. Governments rapidly innovated to maintain and provide relief in critical times of need. And now they're better positioned to engage with citizens directly and efficiently. And we're privileged to work with governments around the world. One example that I find incredible was the government of India, where we worked to help them execute the largest vaccine drive in history through an application they call CoWin that was built as a cloud native application on AWS to provide countrywide vaccine registration and scheduling and management. When it first opened, 1.9 million people accessed the system. That's pretty big scale. Less than a year later, 2 billion vaccine doses have been administered and managed for people, and they continue to use the system every day. That is scale. Um, while this technology has also continued to meet the healthcare needs on the front lines for more people, it's also exposed long-standing social and structural disparities in those populations uh, because of the different impact that COVID-19 had on underserved populations. And realizing that there's a gap in health equity, just last year I announced a program uh, committing $40 million to uh, over three years uh, in AWS cloud credits and technical assistance to be able to help organizations deliver solutions to address health equity globally. And we've already seen some great progress from existing uh, participants who are on the first round of grant applications. And I'm excited to say for anybody who is working on or interested in health equity, we'd love to partner with you. We're accepting new applications uh, through June 30th, and we encourage everyone to apply and come think big with us. Uh, and help address the disparities in health equity around the world. Let me move on to education, where using AWS cloud technology helped introduce entirely new ways that educators and learners could communicate and engage. As COVID-19 shut down schools and on-site proctoring and uh, educational organizations 
were forced to quickly respond, they didn't have the infrastructure in place to be able to provide that capability. And this is where AWS stepped in, was able to deliver the flexibility and the scalability uh, that was necessary. And now, with that basis, is providing entirely new ways to be able to address changing preferences, actually, for a hybrid environment and for personalized digital experiences. And one example is with the University College of London's on-premise Moodle environment. It could only handle 2,500 students when the pandemic first hit. We were fortunate to work with them. They called our team, and we started to help them in just 10 weeks migrate their on-prem system to the cloud so that they were ready for the fall 2020 system in a virtual environment. And what that's now allowed them to do is be able to have the system in the place on the cloud that can scale up to support more than 50,000 students and staff members around the world in 150 countries. They simply weren't able to do that with their old on-premise infrastructure. And since I mentioned our infrastructure a little bit, let me give you a bit of an update. Um, while there while there have been a number of changes over these past years that have caused customers to rethink their missions, the one thing that has remained constant and that we continue to expand on is the global infrastructure that you have access to through AWS. Millions of customers trust AWS to improve their security posture and become more agile and lower costs. And one of the many reasons that customers are able to do this is because of the scale that we bring. Currently, AWS has 26 global cloud computing regions that are made up of clusters of data centers with 84 availability zones to provide exceptionally high resilience and exceptionally high availability. And we've announced plans for eight more AWS regions around the world, adding more than 24 additional availability zones. And we've started expanding the cloud to even more locations using what we call local zones. The local zone extends the cloud out in the US to a further 16 different states and cities. And we've now announced plans to launch 32 local zones in metropolitan areas around the world in a further 26 countries, um, including right here in Belgium and the Netherlands, and in fact, a total of 12 more local zones across Europe. So I, I, uh, I hope that continues to let you build and, and innovate right here. Now, as much as we're committed to innovation and economic growth all over Europe, we know that security and trust are foundational. As we continue to build and grow, security remains our top priority. Our customers retain ownership and control of all of their data, including where it's stored, how it's stored, and how you grant access to it. Our commitment to customer control and choice goes even further than that. We're the only US hyperscale provider that has declared adherence to the infrastructure, infrastructure as service code of conduct on switching cloud providers and porting data. It's called SWIPO. And we think you should ask your cloud providers, are they supporting your ability and your freedom to choose and make change? We've also supported Gaia-X to define standards for the next generation of data infrastructure by contributing to the technical working groups during the formation of Gaia-X. And as requirements become more complex, what we've also seen is that the threat landscape is more active now than at any time in the past. Customers who choose AWS get to take advantage of more than three, 230 security, compliance, and governance services and features specifically designed to help them deliver the, the security they need while moving fast and staying focused on your business or your mission. And our customers are delighted to see us continue to find new offers and new services that enhances their ability to build and be innovative on the AWS cloud. Whatever your needs are, we're here to help. And so it's been great to be able to talk to everybody here in person once again and welcome our virtual audience as well. Um, we've delivered some incredible enhancements, but more incredible is the work that our customers have been doing, whether it's in government or education or healthcare or our private sector. Um, we're inspired by the efforts of our customers and our partners in the way that they're forging ahead 
not slowing down, and in fact using the lessons and the momentum from the difficult times over the past two years to keep driving forward on innovation. So thank you all again for everything that you're doing. Keep pushing new boundaries, keep paving new paths. There are so many opportunities ahead. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to our keynote speaker, who's gonna dive deeper into data privacy, protection, social responsibility, and services that are gonna help you along in your cloud journey. Alexa, can you help me welcome Isabella to the stage? Please welcome to the stage, Vice President of EMEA Sales for AWS Worldwide Public Sector, Isabella Gregor Chekovitz. And we can clap. Thank you so much, Max, for kicking off the first AWS Summit in 2022. And welcome back to Brussels. It's really great to have you back here. Now, on my way to this event from Heidelberg, I have been thinking about how lucky we are that these events, and Max shared that already, that these in-person events are becoming possible again. But when we look what's happening around us, that's probably not really true for all of us. So Max already shared that um, in, in, his, um, in his remarks. I think we are all watching what is currently happening in Ukraine. Um, and we are helping wherever we can help. We are working with our partners, we are working with the customers to keep their data secure, but we are also helping them and assisting them um, in fending off cyber attacks around the clock um, in this quite difficult times. So it is a time where it's super important that all of us think about how we can help those who desperately need our help at the moment. Um, we have also a strong community of customers and partners that are standing up solutions to help people in Ukraine, um, and we are absolutely ready to support them. Um, think about education. Um, Max touched on that one as well. Education is important. Children need continuity. Children need this engagement. And here is the Optima School, which is the one, the, I think it's the first and the largest remote education school in Ukraine. They are still providing education to Ukrainian children. They started with 9,000 to support, and within a month, they scaled up to 80,000, and they provide that, that for free and give the kids the continuity. I think this is a great example. So we will continue to support our customers, to aid our customers in their response efforts that they have, and I encourage all of us to think together what we, what our organizations can do to assist and to be able to offer this assistance in these difficult times. Now, coming back to our event here today, I would like to thank you all for being here with us today, whether this is in, the, in person here or it's virtually in the community. It is a big commitment. You are spending a full day with us um, to get inspired, to think about new ways into the cloud. So thank you already for that one. We have built an agenda that we hope is going to inspire you in, in all aspects of how to further strive into this tr digital transformation and the journey to the cloud. And we have three tracks and 20 sessions where we're gonna showcase what our customers are doing with solutions and services on an everyday basis. There is something for literally everybody, whether you are starting with our AWS or you are running multiple workloads or you are using many different services. But today would not be possible if it would not be for our sponsors. And I like to thank our global sponsors, first of all. So thank you to Intel, VMware, Datadog, VM, Neuralic, and Palo Alto Networks. All of our sponsors have been really critical in helping us to produce today's summit. And we are also super um, we are also super grateful for our gold, silver, and 
um, and exhibition sponsors. Well, as you can see, they are coming from really a wide variety of specialties, but what unites them is that they are all super passionate about the transformation, digital transformation and the transformation into the cloud. So if you haven't yet not been in the exhibition space, I hope that you can take the time to get there, to get to know them, what they are doing and how they can help you in the transformation and in your digital journey, the journey to the cloud. Now, the growth adoption in EMEA is amazing, re really amazing to see, and I'm absolutely excited being in, in really interacting very closely with the whole region. So cloud has become so much more than compute and storage, and it's practically part of our everyday lives. So we really have millions of customers that are active with us, that are transforming in the cloud, that are in the cloud. And these ones that you see here are just some of them. And our customer base is growing, so we want to support our customers also locally, where they are. That's why we are now running about 54 offices in 30 countries, and when we look, for example, at Benelux, that includes Brussels, it's Amsterdam, The Hague, and um, Luxembourg. And we are also present with 15 development centers in 10 countries. And speaking of development centers, we are doing really cool stuff there. I'm not talking about developing infrastructure, although infrastructure can be cool as well. But in Berlin, we are, for example, hosting teams from Alexa, as well as Amazon Musing for predictive analytics. In Dresden, the team is thinking about the EC2 future. And in Tübingen, we are doing cutting edge um, research on computer vision, as well as the accountability of AI algorithms. So we are developing all that with the local brain power in the local communities, rolling that out into the international context to benefit it to all our customers around the world, but also, of course, to the local communities that are then building out more capabilities, capacity, also um, startups, etc. cetera. Um, so when our customers are embarking on their modernization journey, there are three areas, there are three topics that are predominantly coming up and we are talking about that with them every day. They, they are interested about how is my data protected? Is my data secure? Secondly, what is the carbon footprint I'm gonna leave related to the cloud? That's of, of, of really vast interest. And more and more coming out is the question of what is the overall social impact? Quite often also was the, was the public sector customers that is attached to the cloud adoption. And today we are gonna dive into all of three of those areas, as Max already mentioned. Um, so just let's get started. Now, when our customers, and we're talking about data protection, when our customers modernize here in EMEA, the data protection, the protection of their data is always top of their mind. And hence it's not really surprising that Europe leads with the creation of GDPR because here in Europe, we as Europeans believe that there is a right for people to have control over their data and to be assured that the data is protected. And we also know that security and trust are the foundations to drive digital transformation. And we want to build this trust in the collaboration with you because we want to support you in your digital journey. We think this is a great opportunity for the future and so we are obtaining the relevant and a vast range of relevant certifications like those ones that you see here which are very relevant also for our European customers. Um, and we are, but there is many more that we, that we obtained and we have that you can look up and we can provide you those informations. And we also 
look at the, at the relevance of how we are relating our services to certain regulations. And we have recently announced the AWS services that adhere to the CISP Data Protection Code of Conduct for added GDPR assurance. So think about it in the way as you modernize with and in the cloud, the cloud is continuously being modernized too. And innovated, of course. The, we, we talked about that security and trust build the basis for the digital transformation, and it's also the basis for the innovation effort. And I came back on Monday from a longer Middle East trip and also visited the government of Bahrain. Now, talking about the trust, the government in Bahrain has built out the trust level based of the interaction and also the security and, and data protection levels and is moving to become the first cloud native country in the world. 70% of the workloads are already in the cloud. They strive now for 100%. This has reduced their infrastructure readiness time for their projects by about 60%. The other part to it that they are continuing on the cloud native policy, but what they also strive for is the implementation of bring your own jurisdiction, which is a major innovation in the public sector, and we are very excited to see how this is going to be evolving. But you do such massive changes only if you rely on the highest level of security and data protection. Looking at the commercial side and looking more from a technical perspective, what we are doing there in security and how we work with our customers together, there is the example of Siemens. Their security team is managing hundreds of accounts and they saw the need to strengthen their platform's security posture. So they were already using Amazon Guard Duty and then the team decided that they need also to add AWS Security Hub to integrate several software tools that were and are important for driving their workflow. Now the security team has greatly improved its AWS Security Hub scores and is looking to help their teams to develop into the same direction. In every almost, in every mid meeting that I am in, we are talking with our customers about their modernization journey that's based on the cloud, but also on their data protection needs. So, this afternoon, we have a specific session where you can dive deep into learning about how AWS is helping customers in Europe to navigate the new normal for data protection. Please take a moment to check out the Summit app to learn more about the sessions. If this is one is really, really important amongst all the others that we have, of course. So, our customers see the cloud as the first step towards the digital transformation, and our first customer speaker comes to us from the European Commission to share how they saw that moving towards the digital transformation was the path forward for them, allowing them to modernize. Alexa. Please welcome to the stage, Philippe Morrow, Chairman of the Cloud Council of the European Commission. Hello everybody. So I think everybody in the room knows about the European Commission. Um, well, in terms of IT, we are delivering more than 1,000 information systems for 35,000 staff and EU citizens, which makes us the largest IT buyer in Benelux, if I believe the sales representative. You, we have started our cloud journey seven years ago. And we are actually trying to get out of the pioneer age. And it was a long journey. Actually, 
in fancy words, I have to tell you that we are not doing cloud for doing cloud. Somebody has to tell that. We are doing cloud for us because it's the main enabler of our digital transformation. And in the field of building application, it's even more because it's the IT, it's the digital transformation of IT itself for us. So it's pretty important. That's what we thought at the beginning. Therefore, we played big, 30 million. And we played big, and we are pretty happy with the result, actually. Because if I speak about AWS only, uh, our Europa, our websites, more than 100 websites, actually, are running on AWS on a fully automated Drupal platform. And the Office of Publication, uh, the official journal, is also operated on AWS infrastructure. Everything is protected with the fancy security services of AWS, including the DDoS protection. And believe me, in the current context, it was pretty useful. But allow me to stay mysterious, OK? Then I would like to tell you about the most important enablers for these pioneers. Oh, in the center of everything, we have a central cloud broker. I'm French. I like centralization. What is it? Oh, the main goal of the cloud broker, and I have some customers here in the room, it's to deliver cloud resources to my internal customers as fast as they would go to an Amazon website to get an account. And if you know the procurement rules, that's kind of a challenge. But that's the first thing we do. Moreover, we are all coming together for that, you know, Europe stronger together. It allows us to have bigger volume, bigger discounts, and to be better treated as a customer. So for us, it's very important. I have to add to that, buy is very important, but there are two other functions which are delivered centrally. The first one is the support. Pioneers, they are pioneers, but they don't know anything at the start. So they had to be supported. Therefore, we have built a cloud center of excellence without the name even existed. And that was key for them. The other part, my customers are not used to make cost control on a daily basis. Every year, it's okay. So they had to be helped. And, we, and the cloud broker is delivering them the tool in order for them to make this cost control, which is, is coming with modern cloud. Without these three functions, no way the pioneers go, would have gone through. Alors, that was the early days. We suffered, believe me, we sweat, but we defined a strategy. I say but because we did not do it at the beginning. Oh, uh, very quickly, our strategy has two parts, which cloud and which technologies. Oh, very quickly, which clouds. Our strategy is hybrid and multi-cloud. And I can feel Amazon people sweating behind me. Uh, so hybrid because we have more than 1,000 information systems. They are there. They are not going to disappear overnight. So it's hybrid. Multi-cloud, it's because we are doing procurement in a competitive market. We cannot go all in with a provider. So it's by design. But moreover, we like it, actually, because if we have to move, we can move. But we have a policy. Our policy is we are happy to stay with a provider if we are free to leave. And I will come back to that later. But that's very important for us. The other part of the strategy is the technical strategy. And that's the most important for me. If I, something, something you should go at home with, it's what I'm going to say here. Oh, we differentiate three types of architecture. But most importantly, we are all in with DevSecOps and Agile. I'm not saying we are Agile yet. But we abide with the paradigms. And the three architecture we are seeing, they go with DevSecOps or not. Oh, the, the first one is server-based, server virtual machines. Oh, not for DevSecOps, not for cloud for us. That's what we do, but we don't focus on that. The second one, containers. Containers, we love it, because we do not have to change much our applications, which is cool. But still some overhead in, in, uh, in operations. So we have, there is another paradigm, serverless. Oh, serverless for us, that's the top. 
the top why because we managed to cut the number of lines of code we reduce code by 80 to 95 percent in some cases and we did it so DevSecOps plus that maximum efficiency I did not speak about cloud native huh? so because it's very confusing these are these terms we are using then you can tell me what about lock-in serverless lock-in I know for us it's the opposite of lock-in we reduce the number of code therefore we can move more easily provided we are clever choosing the services so that's strictly the opposite that's the paradigm happy to stay if we can leave the last thing uh, there is the brother of DevSecOps infrastructure as code uh, this one is key that's what enables everything and we like AWS for the consistency of the application of the infrastructure as code paradigm that's what enables the real thing then you can say good perfect it's everything ping and full of unicorns at the Commission not at all uh, so if you see the slide there we had a 20% growth in cloud yes pass last year we are used to 70% in a COVID time where we are supposed to accelerate not nice then the diagram shows the level of penetration of cloud inside our organization uh, you see the pioneers on the top no surprise that's the one I mentioned but I have a big cluster of colleagues who have very, very, very low rate adoption so basically it means we are stuck and we need to find a way to re-accelerate oh, that's why I'm going to explain you we very specifically identify seven blockers and four main enablers oh, I spoke about DevSecOps huh? but everything is about uh, transformation transformation cultural transformation so we if I ask to the business are your data safe in the cloud they are going to say me no it's safer in data centers technicians they are going to say strictly the opposite so there is a clash in uh, in the perception and that's what we have to work on internally to tackle this clash we have created a cloud council it's a structure where we are co-create the cloud transformation we ask technicians and, the, and business people to go together to define solutions so that's where they co-create that's why the technicians know about what's happening and they are convinced about the value of the cloud for the business not done yet the first decision of the cloud council it's about sensitive data we are able now to host sensitive data in public cloud like AWS technically there is nothing which blocks us but of course if the business does not agree there is a problem so we are making a awareness campaign on our business community to explain them that basically that an industrial service it's always going to be better than a handmade service that we have done there is the last part it's about support uh, we have one and more hundreds of development teams they are not going to learn everything about all the clouds so we need to give them a layer of central support for them to scale that's what we do that's a difficult equation but that's what we do so with this action we think we will be good to go for the next step so uh, just wish us good luck Thank you so much, Philippe, for sharing the European Commission trans digital transformation journey. I really like that you sh shared all aspects, but I think what you had on the last slide, that the cult cultural transformation is really key, that goes very nicely with, with the earlier piece that I've seen, happy to stay if free to go. I think this comes very nicely, and it's a really, really great concept. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, I have been looking for a segue between the data protection and the security and the next topic, which is sustainability. And then I thought I'm not going to go that far. I'm just going to take an example that is close to my door, which is the city of Heidelberg in Germany. Because this is really a great segue when you dig a little bit deeper and look into it. Um, 
the city is modernizing and innovating to improve the quality of living. This is a smart cities platform. It's an open platform. They are modernizing. They are doing a lot on AWS, but they are also by basing that on fundamental guidelines. And talking about this certain topics becoming more and more important for our customers. I would like to pick two of the fundamental guidelines, which one is climate protection and sustainability, our next topic, and the other one is education and social participation, which also goes into the, into the social impact. So their modernization journey is allowing them to innovate and to build an urban data culture, I really like that one, why they, are pro why they are protecting citizens' data, which also goes to the topic that we have already that we have been already talking about. So, in sustainability, when we talk to our customers, they are more they are basically two questions coming up that they are asking us, and that is what is AWS doing to become or to get to carbon zero, and the second one is and how can you as AWS help me, the customer, to achieve my own sustainability goals. And we want to do things. We want to lead by example. So we want to reduce the carbon footprint and we want to reduce our customer's carbon footprint in our clouds. And we also want to support our customers to drive their sustainability goals. So let me first focus on what we are doing. And Max mentioned that already. Amazon has committed um, to building a sustainable future with our climate pledge, means carbon zero by 2040. We also have in 2021, as AWS joined with others to build out the Climate Neutral Data Center Pact. What does that mean? It means that we are increasing our energy efficiency in our own facilities by design and taking different other measures. In Ireland, for example, the AWS is uses cooling system by predominantly using outside air. So that means that 95% of the year we are cooling our server with air, not using water. I think it is great to see those examples coming to life specifically here in Europe. We are also building wind and solar farms in UK, in Sweden and in Spain to power the, the, our regions here specifically in Europe. And research shows that in Europe the AWS infrastructure is five times more energy efficient and can perform the same action at the same task with 88% lower carbon footprint than on-premise data centers. So this is also great news for our customers. And our commitment goes also to the fact that we want to be fully renewable energy powered by 2025. This is five years ahead of our initial goal. This is just part of our commitment to the pledge and to the planet. Um, let's switch now to how we are helping our customers to achieve their sustainability goals. Um, this month, exactly, we have released the AWS Customer Carbon Footprint tool that makes it easy for customers of all sizes to monitor, analyze, and reduce their carbon footprint. And it allows the customers to set their goals accurately and to measure the emission that is related to the use, with, um, to the use of the AWS. You should check out the tool. It is really a great support and it, it go, gives really, really great insights. So we want to support we want to lead by example and we want to support our customers on the sustainability journey, but we also see that our customers are doing an amazing job in using the cloud technology to pre predict, to take actions and to prevent harm. And one of the examples is the Spanish government that has collaborated to create a tool powered on, our, on, on AWS, on our platform, to 
predict and in that case prevent wildfires. This has been really a big impact on their end. Through AI ML services, this project allowed them to support the prevention of the wildfires as well as the allocation of resources for firefighting. Again, something our customers are doing really for, for, for the planet and for the future. Now, seeing how our customers are innovating for sustainable future is really exciting. Our next speaker is a customer whose mission is to help reduce threats to the diversity of life on Earth. Their program is taking cloud technology and giving us a place where the future can thrive. Alexa, can you please help me welcome our next speaker? Please welcome to the stage, Kirsten Schaub, CEO of the Worldwide Fund for Nature, Netherlands. Hi, good morning. And uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it's not normally a place where I speak as a conservation uh, CEO, but um, we have been working very closely with technology, and it's great for me to share this with you. Um, I just came back last month from a wonderful trip. I spent two weeks traveling through Cameroon and Republic of Congo. And uh, some of you may know this area. It's the biggest tropical rainforest actually after the Amazon in South America. Beautiful, beautiful place. And it's the home for many indigenous people, the Baca. You see a picture on the left. I spent several days with them in the forest. But it's also the home of forest elephants and chimpanzees and gorillas. It's one of the biggest carbon sinks in the world, lots of forests and, of course, peat swamps as well. But it's also under serious threat, um, as are many tropical forests globally, um, from logging, from infrastructure development. There's dams being developed, uh, railways, roads, agriculture, of course, and wildlife crime. We've lost about 50% of the forest elephants in Congo Basin in 10 years' time. And this is just one example, just one place that I, I happened to travel to last month after two years of non-traveling. But actually, this is the story of every tropical rainforest uh, across the globe, and of course, also the story of many of our beautiful, biodiverse places that we're losing uh, every single day. And um, well, th throughout our 60-year history, WWF is, as you know, a conservation organization, um, and, and we're very committed conservationists. By now, we've become the largest conservation organization, and we work across 100 countries, across five continents, and over the decades, we've actually developed and evolved, where 60 years ago, we'd be focusing very much on species, like the forest elephants that I was talking about, rhinos, tigers, polar bears. And in 60 years' time, we've, we have evolved and moved on to actually focus on entire landscapes, um, which is, of course, where these species live and where they depend on, but also on, on driving market transformation, on greening the financial sector, transforming food chains like production and the way we produce and consume food, and also delivering inclusive conservation, uh, which is about working very closely with local communities to conserve their forests, the forests in which, uh, in which they live. And our mission is to conserve nature and reduce the most pressing threats to the diversity of life on Earth. But even with about 8,000 staff, that's really, really difficult, as you can imagine, to do. Where to make choices? Everything is important. Congo Basin is important, as is the Amazon, as in Bor is Borneo, as is you know, the Arctic. And we're really being forced more and more to make smart choices about priorities and where we really want to make an impact. And technology, such as AI, we found in remotely sensed data, hold an immense promise to create more efficient solutions for more data-driven conservation and offer great opportunities actually for us to make better decisions in this very, very complex world. And um, one of the examples that we've been working on over the past year, something which I've also been involved in uh, many years ago, is actually what we're, we're calling forest foresight. And it's a way of us using these new technologies to help predict uh, deforestation. It's an early warning system where you can imagine that for many years WWF has been working with technology, mostly remote sensing, satellite data. But by the time we got that information and we got to the decision makers around the table, it was actually too late. The deforestation was already taking place. And the key question that we were asking is, can we get data 
much faster so that by the time we get to the table of the decision makers, we can actually influence and stop deforestation and hopefully uh, reverse that trend. So um, in close collaboration with national governments, um, we're currently testing the system, and we're doing that in three countries. Uh, one is in Gabon, in the Congo Basin, in Africa, in Suriname, in the Amazon, and then in Borneo, in Southeast A East Asia. These are, of course, three places with huge forest cover, cover but also huge th threats to losing that forest cover. And in this program, WWF does what it does best, I think, which is really bringing together the various stakeholders from the technical partners like AWS and Deloitte, who assist us with the technological uh, developments, to national governments, to local stakeholders, and again, bringing these people around the table to make sure that we get the information on time and hopefully stop, uh, stop deforestation. And the result is a tailored solution that offers stakeholders the knowledge and the tools to protect their own forests. And strong collaboration among these different partners, including technical partners, who align with us on sustainability ambitions. Now, we couldn't have developed this at all. I mean, we're a conservation organization. We don't really have a lot of techno technical expertise. So we could not have done such a complex technical solution on our own. And our partners, AWS and Deloitte, have been absolutely crucial to work with us to develop um, the system and, and to move from ideation and prototyping this across these landscapes to actually uh, uh, effectively applying this, this technology at scale. Just to give you an example, in the initial prototype, um, just the pre-processing for a pilot area in Borneo took about 12 hours for us to get the information. But of course, our goal was to use this model in tropical forests across the globe and this seemed out of reach with the initial approach. And so this is when Deloitte helped us to implement the solution using AWS native serverless, serviceless technologies such as Lambda and SageMaker, which enabled us to take the pre-processing down to four hours, so from 12 hours to four hours, which of course is a massive efficiency, particularly when you're dealing with such big threats as deforestation. Now, um, Gabon is the first country where we're actually piloting uh, forest foresight and with great success. We spent six months piloting it, doing field investigations across 30, um, 34 predicted locations. And in one of the places in Minkebe National Park in Gabon, a beautiful area, uh, we actually followed up on these deforestation predictions and managed to uncover illegal gold mining in time to save about 30 uh, hectares of uh, forest from illegal deforestation, which is a great conservation success. Now, these results caused the system to be embraced by all involved stakeholders. And at this moment, we're actually working with the government to roll out this system nationally across Gabon, across the whole country. And of course, we're also hoping to do this in the other places where we, where we work. Now, um, we've learned several things. I, th I think the most important thing for us is how important it is to work with local stakeholders. So it's great that we develop all these technological systems, but in the end, we really want these to be owned by the people who live and work in these places. And so they're the ones that know best what's driving the changes in their landscapes. They're increasingly have you know, better expertise in, in remote sensing and modeling techniques and have a very strong desire to better understand the models and the tools that, we, that we're employing. So this makes it also really important, which is the second lesson, to be absolutely transparent about how the tools work and to ensure the explainability of AI. So in the case of Forest Foresight, this meant ensuring that we have clear information on what is driving these specific predictions so the information can actually be shared and passed on to the right teams that are responsible for tackling these drivers of deforestation. Mining companies, forestry departments, environmental departments, and, and other uh, important local stakeholders. So in short, uh, in, in conclusion, um, I think what we have done by working together with AWS uh, and Deloitte, we've really shown how technology can be applied to deliver conservation outcomes in actually some of the most difficult places where we work. And uh, with WWF in the role of coordinating the innovation process from ideation and prototyping to scaling, we're actually ensuring that the technology fits the needs of the stakeholders on the ground and is built transparently and inclusively with the local population to address common conservation goals.
And we look forward to continue to collaborate with our strong technical partners to deliver these solutions that produce conservation impact. And with these kinds of technologies, I am optimistic that in places like Congo Basin, in places like Cameroon and Republic of Congo, where I just came from, that um, you know, we, can, we can contribute to conserving these hugely important places for the Baka indigenous people, for the forest elephants and the chimpanzees and the gorillas, but also for many future generations to come. And with that, I thank you for listening. Yes, and thank you so much for sharing all of that insights. And also, it's really amazing and great to see that this forest foresight is helping to predict and to and prevent deforestation, right? And how how that works together with AWS and with AWS partners like Deloitte, bringing that great results. And we are super proud of that partnership. Thank, thank you very you. much again. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Now, let's now talk about social impact. Um, and social impact has thousands of different facets, but let's focus on the skill development side. And the skill development side hits the, the, local, the, the local employment markets, the, 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 it hits the startups, it hits the SMB development, and also the acceleration of the transformation, digital transformation in large enterprises. It's super critical. It always was, but coming now, looking into the future, that is really a big impact. And we have heard a lot of examples today from, from different businesses, from different areas of the government. But what that also translates to is to bring those projects to deployment and bringing them to life means that you really need to have that skilled, skilled workforce. And the skilled workforce needs to come from those who are just starting their career down to those ones who are 20 plus years already in it. And that means that while innovation is constantly around, it means that the workforce needs to evolve continuously, but that also means that it needs to stay ahead of the innovation. And this is super important and super critical. Now, you would say, yeah, given. I mean, we talk about it every day. Governments are doing a lot in that space. That's true. But did you know that in Europe, public sector, 70% of organizations say that they are now accelerating their move to the cloud to deliver critical um, services to the citizens. At the same time, 36% are saying that they do not have the right skills and they don't have the experience. And that slows down the transformation process and that also slows down this workforce transition. So what are we doing here? Now, we are first of all committed to provide 29 million people around the world with access to free cloud training by 2025. This is one of the commitments we made. And just this month, AWS announced two new free training initiatives to help individuals build foundational cloud skills. One of those is AWS Cloud Quest. It's game-based, it's role-playing experience. This is ideal for starters and also for new to cloud adult learners. And it teaches foundational cloud computing concepts through interact interactive challenges within a city. I think this really sounds pretty cool. For those who are beginners, of course, many of you are gonna be those ones who are also advanced. The other one, is an improved version of AWS Educate that has added interactive content and made the program more accessible to all. And we provide that program in different languages, in English, French, German, Spanish, and Portuguese, to support our EMEA customers and citizens in a local context. And we, we understand that the, the importance of providing local language versions don't we, Alexa? Yeah, well, I take that for yes um, so far. 
So these two new initiatives are part of how we are making it easy for anyone to gain cloud knowledge and practical experience. There is another example, um, in, and this, this is like the inspiration of the dig digital knowledge in the SMB context through the AWS Cloud Lab at the Cupola XS. And Cupola XS has launched a center for SMB business, which is in one place with resources and education they need to really transition into the cloud, into, into, into go, getting into the digital transformation. There are multiple players engaged, which is the government, they are partners, there's Cupola XS, and we also are part of this innovation lab where we want to really stimulate the digital knowledge, people getting into it in the SMB space where they may not have enough capacity themselves to really drive this transformation process. This is essential for the Dutch SMB business and it's also really important for the Netherlands and I'm super pleased to announce that the AWS Cloud Lab at Cupola XS is the first cloud provider that presents, that, that partners with this innovation initiative and we are aiming for about one million visitors a year. The, the location as such is also quite inspirational. Does anybody know here where that is? This is a prison in Harlem. So think this to the end when you are innovating there. I think this is a pretty cool environment. Now, but we don't only need skilled for the workforce, we also need a more diverse one and a more equitable one and a more inclusive one. So we must and we want to prepare people with all backgrounds and all abilities with programs such as AWS Skill Builder, apprenticeship programs, as well as many different diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. We so far have also invested really significantly, for example, into the STEM focus programs. It's not only about skilling, it is also making sure that there is a certification behind. And that benefits not only the learners, but also the organizations they are working for. Our certification numbers are also growing. So by August, I think last year, we had re reported 575,000 over, over that number of people holding an active AWS certificate. And on Sunday, I have been in Cairo at a hackathon and have been just standing with the minister when a graduate came by and shared his story that he was looking for a job for two years. And after he has received the certifications for the, for the AWS cloud, he got directly employed by one of the local providers. So I think this is a story which we want to replicate and we want to see more of those. Now, training the workforce has enabled organizations to activate, to grow and to innovate. Our last speaker is a local startup that went all in on AWS and understands that to grow and stuff up training is really key in building workforce that can manage and innovate on cloud technology. Alexa, can you introduce my last speaker, please? Please welcome to the stage, Arun Minert, Chief Architect and Head of Data for Showpad. Good morning, uh, my name is Jeroen and I'm Chief Architect at Showpad. Showpad is a company that empowers modern sales teams. And we see two challenges with these sales teams. On one hand, we have sales reps that lack access to relevant and convincing marketing content to engage with their buyers. And on the other hand, we have sales managers who lack the insights to correctly coach and steer their reps to success. And this leads to terrible buyer experiences and missed opportunities. 
Showpad gives businesses a revenue enablement platform that uses state-of-the-art technologies like digital deal rooms and video messaging to enable sales reps to share personalized content to deliver the best buyer experience. And on top of that, Showpad gives sales managers the insights to bring their teams to the next level, bridge the gap, and accelerate their sales cycles. And this sales enablement space has been continually evolving. The last couple of years in particular were a great example of the change in the market. And since Showpad was founded in 2011, we have adapted to changing market conditions and consistently innovated to stay ahead of the curve. And AWS has been instrumental in our journey. Like every small startup, Showpad started with a very, very basic setup. A Linux server running PHP and a MySQL database to store customer data. We ran this successfully with a local partner in Ghent and did this for about four years. And as you can expect, during this period, we manually upgraded our servers, we added resilience, and we implemented redundancy for customer file storage. Then, in 2015, we needed more firepower to grow our customer base. And for that, we contacted AWS to help us move from on-premise to the cloud. We began our journey with a simple lift and shift of our current infrastructure, limiting the use of managed services, but focusing mostly on containerization to transfer workloads. And by adopting technologies like Kubernetes, EC2, and S3, we were able to enter the next level of scaling and deploying, improve SLAs, and reduce overhead for our engineers. In 2020, we took our collaboration to the next level as we fully embraced the cloud. We doubled down on serverless technologies like Lambda, API Gateway, DynamoDB, and many others to remove the heavy lifting and provide the headspace for innovation. Today, Showpad is a company of more than 500 employees. And as we are reaching our 100 million annual recurring revenue mark, we are serving more than 1,200 customers in across 50 countries in the world. We power more than 3.2 million buyer interactions, resulting in an improvement of sales and marketing productivity by 25%. And we do all this within our SLA of 99.97%. After two years of fully embracing the cloud, we are now using more than 80 services of AWS. And for the eagle eyes here in the room, I can confirm that these icons are the icons of the actual services that we're using today at Showpad. But aside from adopting AWS services, we are also embracing the cloud by tightly collaborating with AWS. We regularly engage in AWS immersion days, and we collaborate with our solution engineers to deliver on customer needs. And to ensure that we can scale our craftsmanship on AWS, we have a strong certification program running at Showpad. In less than two years' time, we accumulated 73 certifications, and we currently have 85 exams coming up of engineers at Showpad. And in particular, there's one champion at Showpad that has seven certifications, and he's here with us in this room. So I just want to take the opportunity to give him a round of applause. All right, so you can see by my enthusiasm how impressed I am with AWS and how they have helped us scale over the years. They help us optimize our customer experience, bring operational excellence, and improve reliability and security over our platform. One such area where we have really seen an improvement is in the delivery of marketing content to sales and buyers. Since the very early days of Showpad, we have specialized in ensuring that marketing departments can deliver the right collection of files to, with, just, with just a click of a button. And with the right information in their hands, sellers can provide the best experience for their buyers and accelerate their sales cycle. And it's important that this marketing content ends up in, the, in our hands of our users in a reliable, secure, and performant manner. And in the very early days of Showpad, we created our asset delivery network. This was designed to accelerate file downloads over several points of presence around the world. And we wanted to do this while strictly respecting the compliance and security rules that help our customers share information in the most confidential way possible. However, as our business grew, we noticed that the time spent in maintaining this network prevented us from focusing on other areas of innovation. 
And on top of that, the increased use of video content made it clear that we needed to invest in a much stronger download backbone to deal with increased file sizes and, and throughput. So we took the challenge to AWS and landed with a completely managed infrastructure that has been, and I can promise you, extremely battle-tested and proven to be very, very efficient. And of course, as you might expect, this has all been based on CloudFront. CloudFront is Amazon Web Services content delivery network. It allows secure delivery of content with low latency and high transfer speeds. The tight integration with S3 and the highly secure and available setup meant that we could easily roll this out without too much configuration. But there are two key features that really made a difference for us and our customers. First of all, the more than 300 points of presence means that we are now capable of serving regions that before were considered too low on return on investment. Overall, this created a much improved customer experience when viewing files in Showpad. So on average, we were able to double our download speeds, and in some regions, we even saw a 10x improvement. Second of all, a technology like AWS Lambda at Edge provided to, proved to be fundamental. Not only did it allow us to perform fast access checking at the edge, but it also allowed us to satisfy our customers' desire to control in which areas of the world their files are being cached. We have now completely removed our custom-built asset delivery network and completely replaced it with CloudFront. This means for us less code to maintain, less things that can go wrong, more focus on innovation, and most importantly, faster marketing content in the hands of our customers. And in all honesty, I could not be happier with this. And I could go on and on sharing all these incredible stories of Showpad, where we build on top of AWS services to provide more customer value and increase developer productivity. Areas such as data engineering, machine learning, video processing, networking, and analytics have all benefited from our relationship with AWS and the services that they offer. And as we shape our future, we see AWS as a very important partner for us. Aside from the raw technology that they provide, the true value in our relationship comes from them and us interacting and shaping our solutions. They have simply become an essential part in our journey to grow and to innovate. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing your story. What I really love about it is that you as a startup came up to solve a challenge, and by that you also discovered that you need to build up the workforce to be able to start, go, keep going and innovating and modernizing. So thank you for sharing that again. Now, coming to our closing. Thank you all again for being here today with us. Really appreciate that, being it in person here or being it in the virtual community. I also want to thank our speakers who have joined me on stage and who shared their inspirational stories about their transformation into the cloud. But before you go and enjoy the rest of the day, I would like to leave you with three takeaways. The first one is data protection is top of mind with our customers, and because we are customers obsessed, this is top of mind for us too. We deliver data protection and security in different ways, so let's engage on that one and discuss how that fits into your digital transformation. Sustainability is key, and we want to help you to reduce your footprint in the cloud, as well as achieve your sustainability goals. We do that with our experts and also our tools. This is, I think, really a great segue. It's a great way to get there. And third one, skilled workforce is going to make the difference in future. We want to engage and bring this cloud capabilities, digital transformation to life together with you. Thank you very much, and enjoy the day. Thank you.